to our season finale of the chat. We are here today with Glenn E. Martin. It's such an honor to have you with us today. Thank you. I'm super glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. And we are talking about Leadership IQ. So you're the perfect person to have in this spot. I know all of our viewers have actually in several uh, prior episodes have actually quoted you um, over and over again. So I know everyone's going to be really excited about what you have to say about Leadership IQ. And that just kind of brings me into like, how how did you end up with such dynamic opportunities um, for yourself? And like, what are the skill sets that you brought out of those opportunities? Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, people give me uh, a lot of credit for the set of skills that I've been able to pick up over the last 20 years in the nonprofit space. Um, but the truth is, I'm not exceptional. I was just exposed to exceptional opportunities, particularly when I first came home from prison. Um, that was 20 years ago. And I served six years in New York and had many of the same challenges that other people have coming home, uh, housing instability, uh, lack of employment, um, lack of you know identification cards and those sorts of things. Um, but I landed at a reentry organization that doesn't even exist now, but it was run by a formerly incarcerated person. And you know he connected with me and he decided that he was just not gonna let me fail. And that meant literally coming to my house and waking me up and taking me to job interviews and waiting outside of the job interview. I'll never forget that. But what probably was most inspiring was that he himself was formerly incarcerated. I remember his name, his name is George Lino. I never forgot it. Um, and so seeing in him uh, a guy who was in prison, you know, wearing a suit, doing the work thing, getting paid, being a manager, it was just really inspiring for me and gave me hope um, because it's so easy to lose hope, particularly in the first 30 to 60 days of coming home. And like most other people, I just kept getting turned down for jobs over and over and over again. But he took me on a job interview at a place called the Legal Action Center in New York, which is a nonprofit public interest law firm. And it was a front desk job answering the phone. It was less than 20 grand a year. And I was $83,000 in debt, fines, fees, restitution, child support, and so on. But I saw a place where there was a potential for growth. And I saw a place where I'd be surrounded by you know, really intelligent, progressive, um, motivated um, lawyers who I thought could teach me and, and make me into uh, a better person and a better employee. And I was right. Um, I stayed there for about six and a half years. I applied for about five different positions over those six and a half years and got into those various roles. Um, by the time I left six and a half years later, I was the co-director co of uh, the largest project there called the National Hire Network. And Hire stood for helping individuals re-enter through employment. What's really important about that opportunity is that, you know, when you get out of prison at first, you can use your own experience to sort of guide your thinking about what we might do differently in criminal justice. But after a couple of years, you have to have the humility to, to start listening to other people's stories and having that help shape your thinking. And because I was a paralegal there at one point, even though I had five positions, the paralegal position in particular exposed me to hundreds, if not thousands of other people who are navigating reentry. And that really helped shape my thinking. It also moved me away from thinking that my experiences were anecdotal. I realized that they were actually very systemic. And I realized that punitiveness um, didn't only exist in our criminal justice system, that it actually existed in our uh, human resources system, our educational system, uh, you name it, a number of places where we've decided that punishment uh, is the way we're going to handle each other as human beings in, in this country. So when I got to a bit of a glass ceiling, I mean, it's a law firm. I wasn't interested in going to law school necessarily. Plus, I felt like I could do all the things the lawyers could do short of litigation. And so I started thinking, well, what do you do next? And this whole drive to make sure I wasn't just using my own story to, to tell a story and to listen to other people uh, drove me to the Fortune Society. And I ended up uh, as senior vice president there where I was able to learn more and more uh, from the people who were going through reentry. I mean, it's a large longstanding reentry organization that at the time was serving 4,000 people per year. But I went there to launch an advocacy unit called the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy named after the founder and then took over communications, marketing and then took over fundraising and the reason that's important is because even back then, I thought I wanted to launch my own organization, but there was something to be said for learning under other people, 
learning the things that you might want to do and the skills you may need, but also learning some of the things you might not want to do. Some of the things that you might say to yourself, you know what, I have other ideas. I have better ideas. I have ideas that feel more culturally competent, you name it. And then stayed there for about six and a half years um, and then left uh, to launch Just Leadership USA. And the goal of Just Leadership USA um, was to really recognize that if I could take all of the experiences I've had and package them and share them with other formerly incarcerated people, then we could kind of build a movement of people that had these range of skills that I think it takes to build a successful movement. And that's where people closest to the problem or closest to the solution came for me because all the work I had done before that, I felt as though I was sort of being added to a conversation that was already happening. I was being invited to a table that was already set. And what I recognized was that people would often pat me on the shoulder and say, you know, that was some really interesting information you added to that meeting. And at first I thought people were just, you know, just sort of uh, doing it to motivate me. But then it was so consistent. I was like, wow, maybe I am adding something really unique to the conversation. But imagine if it wasn't just me. And I built Just Leadership USA to invest in the leadership of other formerly incarcerated people. And I always remember a meeting with uh, Jeff Sessions where I was trying to get him to be interested in education for people in prison. And I didn't tell him at first that I earned a quality two-year liberal arts degree in prison. And I had a long conversation with him and his staff. And when I thought I was sort of losing him and wasn't getting him on our side, I told him that I had gone to college in prison. And, and he pivoted a bit and he became a bit softer and a bit more human and a bit more compassionate, if you can believe that. And I had him sort of saying, wow, not you, really? You went to, wow, I would have never thought that, et cetera, et cetera. But I always remember at the end, he summed it up by saying, well, I'm not going to change a policy just because a blind squirrel finds an acorn. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's all right. I've had people say a lot of harsh things to me in my career, but yeah. I, tend to, I tend to take the lessons from them and leave the rest. Um, but the point I was making is this, like I wanted him and others in the United States to see that I am not a blind squirrel and I, and I did not find an acorn and that we lock up some of America's best and brightest. And so I thought one way to do that was to actually build this organization to invest in other people uh, similarly situated. And then I could talk all about uh, consulting and real estate and sneakers and all this other stuff. But let me stop there for a minute because this was meant to sort of show you the sort of journey, uh, some of it serendipitous. Uh, particularly through the nonprofit space that allowed me to have the range of skills it takes to continue to be a founder and a leader and, and so on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that's phenomenal. And I don't know that everyone knows your backstory and all of the, like, the things that you went through to get you where you are today. Like, I heard you talking about the importance of the peer-to-peer -peer support by somebody who had been through a similar situation as you and that being very crucial to see yourself in someone. Um, yeah, I, I always say to people, um, you know, if you see a, if you see a turtle on top of a pole, um, he didn't get there by himself. Someone put him there. And uh, I got that saying from a good friend of mine, Nick Turner, who runs Vera. But it's absolutely true that, you know, no one gets no leader, no manager, no successful person gets to where they are by themselves. Now, it's fascinating that leaders are able to convince people of that. Right. Um but the truth is, if you really demystify it for people, which I think all leaders should, you remind people that you absolutely need a network, you need peers to get you where you're going. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. And I, and I also heard you talking about in those early days, how you took things that, you know, you humbled yourself to take a position that may not have been the position that you wanted. It sounds like it wasn't paying very well, probably wasn't the title that you knew you had the skills for. and learned from the environment around you, took the things and gave the things that you needed to kind of build and move forward with the, that information. Yeah, you know, something I sort of alluded to, but didn't sort of hit the nail on the head in the story was, um, before I went to Fortune Society, I met with one of the biggest uh, philanthropic uh, foundations in the space and said, I want to launch my own nonprofit. And it was some version of just leadership, except some very early rudimentary version of it. And the person looked me in the face and said, you're not ready. You need to go work for someone else for a while and pick up the skills you need. And I was angry. 
You know, I thought I was ready, but honestly, it's one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten in my career because I wasn't ready. And because I really did need to have some humility and recognize that there are other people who've come uh, before me who've done a lot of work. And, you know, my whole career has been about people who've come before me. I think of Eddie Ellis, who's no longer with us, uh, who was a formerly incarcerated leader here in New York, who I was hearing about when I was in a prison cell, to be honest. And I was like, what? He's been in prison and he's like talking crap publicly and like pushing legislators around. Like, I've never heard of that. Um, I almost felt like a superhero and divine prior and a handful of others. And I've always said, like, anything I've been able to build is because someone else built something and I just thought I could do something to improve it. Yeah. And then, that, I mean, that brought you up to Just Leadership USA, which has produced some of the most phenomenal leaders that we have in this country, really, of formerly incarcerated folks. Um, and so that's such a beautiful thing. I mean, to, and so when was it when, when was it where you were like, you know what, I am ready? Like, because it, it sounded like you, you were like, I'm ready to take that step. Yeah, it's interesting you would ask that. So there was a person named David Mensa, who is a leadership trainer and coach who I had met a few years earlier at a uh, fellowship opportunity where the things he taught me really just changed the trajectory of my career considerably. But I recognized that what he was teaching was for um, leaders of color, but not leaders of color who've been in the criminal justice system. And I said to myself, whoa, if I could take the best of what he has to offer and reshape it so that it's more um, contextual for people like me, like for instance, in the middle of the training, there's a moment where he says, think back to when you were in college in the dorms. And I'm like, well, it wasn't quite in the dorms. I was in a cell. <laughs> um, and so I was thinking like, how do I take the good stuff that he brings to the table and, and mix it and, and make it something that would be uh, re relevant to people like me? But I tell that story to say um, there was a moment where I was in his training and I was questioning something my supervisor was doing. And he kept saying, well, why are you just questioning it? Why are you not actually doing something about it? And I kept saying, well, she's been doing this for 20 years, over 20 years. Like she must know what she's doing, et cetera, et cetera. And he just sort of deadpanned on me and said, like, that's not true. Like you should own your greatness and trust your own leadership and trust your own instinct. And and it just gave me license, if you will, to um, recognize that, you know, many leaders are sort of trying to figure it out all the time, right? None of us are in jeopardy of mastering anything. And if you have that humility for yourself, but also for people that you even admire, and you recognize the fallibility of human beings, and the fact that human beings are uh, always experimenting and trying to figure it out, no matter how much they emerge into leadership or are thrust into leadership, um, then I think like that kind of humility is actually what makes you a stronger leader. So there was that moment where instead of looking towards someone else to solve problems that I knew needed to be solved, I just started trusting myself more and uh, be willing to take some more risk. In fact, my first title at Just Leadership when we were still sitting in coffee shops was chief risk taker because I left the job making almost 200 grand a year to sit on my balcony with a concept paper and no money to figure it out. Um, so. That was the moment. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. And yeah, I, yeah, dropping that bit of knowledge about like having to be willing to take risks and trust yourself. I think that trust is such a hard topic for those that have been incarcerated because the trust has been broken down so hard that, you know, building that up, even just with ourselves and other people, it just is a process, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, our criminal justice system, um, has a process, a moment, um, a ceremony, if you will, um, at sentencing, where we take away people's citizenship, their identity, um, their future, um, their, their citizenship, and then we don't have an equal ceremony to give those things back, um, and we leave people there. We, we leave people there. So yes, it really resonates with me what you said about how difficult it is for formerly incarcerated people to even trust themselves because everything about our criminal justice system for the most part teaches us that you shouldn't, that you're not a good person. I never forget the district attorney in my case, even after I took a plea and was about to be sentenced, uh, looked across the table at me and said, your honor, uh, Mr. Martin, um, uh, this is one step short of organized crime and Mr. Martin will never make anything of his life. And he should be lucky that you're offering him this sentence. 
And I still remember that. That was 26 years ago, um, coming from a Black man uh, who could have said something like, please go on, do the right thing, and turn your life around and come back and be an asset to your community. But instead, he left me with something so toxic and so poisonous. Um, having said that, I have learned how to take lemons and plant the seeds and build orchards and sell it, you know, lemons to the world. Exactly. I think that, and that's wonderful. And that's, that's what you have to do too. Cause I think we all have those moments, right. Where we've been like, somebody said something really messed up that could, you know, have led us to taking a different turn, um, just based on the feedback, you know, cause that's what you think that people think about you. So that's, I mean, that's why I think just leadership USA is so phenomenal because it's like the, it's the opposite of that. It's like, you can, you have these abilities, like you said, you're planting lemons and making lemon trees or um so that's phenomenal so i totally understand why you did just leadership usa why the entrepreneurship like because you're you know you have a lot of founders like you mentioned um of a lot of organizations and you've branched out and done so many things so so what is it about the entrepreneurship for you yeah thanks for that i think that uh it took for other people to point out to me that i had this track record of being founder um, I think I was just sort of continuing to build things, whether they were programs, projects, um, uh, coalitions, if you will, just out of sheer need. Um, you know, there's two things you can organize in this world. You can organize money and you can organize people. Um, I didn't have a lot of money to organize, so I just had to constantly organize people. And you do that by building, you know, containers for those relationships to happen, for those communities to exist. And so that's a bit of why I look at my CV now and see so many instances of founding things. Um, more recently, you know, my political mind continues to sharpen as I have experiences in life, both good and bad. And recently, um, I've come to really fundamentally believe, you know, there's an old saying that the revolution will not be televised. I actually believe the revolution will not be funded by white liberal philanthropy. And I think that people of color actually need um, independence through wealth to be able to have the voice they need on these issues. Because I have, I have uh, been slapped on the wrist more than once by uh, progressive funders for saying things that they thought, quote unquote, went too far, but things that I knew resonated with my community and my base and the people who I needed to motivate. And I've also been punished um, by the people who uh, were supporting me just a day earlier um, for things that um, the things that I thought that could be handled differently um, for things where I felt as though I didn't have due process um, for things where I was doing it in a way that resonated with formerly incarcerated people, even if it didn't pass the politics of respectability. Um, if you look at my voice now on social media, it's, uh, I use the sharp end of the axe. It's, it's, it's a different voice than it was just a few years ago. Um, it's very deliberate. It's like, it's the Glenn that grew up in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. It's the Glenn that remembers that kind of um, joy and suffering um, in a way that I wasn't for much of my nonprofit career. And so um, I find that I am a person where when I'm in despair, I tend to, you know, my mind can be brilliant when I'm building things. My mind can be destructive when things are falling apart um, because it works so quickly and it compartmentalizes. And unfortunately, when things are going poorly, it takes me to a finish line of negativity really quickly. And I have to sort of use that energy and pull it back. And I usually do that by building things. And so I've built three businesses over the last just less than four years, to be honest. Um, I built a real estate business from scratch uh, with no resources. In fact, I was financially in a hole when I started. And that business is worth $6 million now and has 55 properties attached to it. Um, I have a consulting business and a handful of subcontractors working with me with a handful of nonprofits that we really know and love and appreciate around the country. And then I have partial ownership in a sneaker business. And those three things, um, the diversity of income, the volume of income, the ability to invest in other leaders of color has given me uh, an independence that I've never enjoyed in my entire life. Like in my entire, I mean, I grew up on poverty. I 
I grew up on Section 8. I grew up, you know, not eating at the 27th of the month because we're trying to make it to the first of the next month. Um, but I'm also recognizing that with wealth, I can turn around and help other people. Like 65% of my renters are six, Section 8 by design. Uh, many of them are people who've been involved in the criminal justice system. I'm able to buy houses from slumlords and turn them into the kind of place I would have wanted to live when I was a poor kid. Um, and so I really want that for other people. Like if we're going to decide capitalism doesn't work, let's decide that as equals. Like let, let my people uh, get to a similar place as other people who are saying capitalism doesn't work. And then let's find out one, whether there's a different form of capitalism that may work. Um, and if not, again, let's make that decision together as equals. And I'm a big fan of that. I think that even when people do wrong, which all human beings do, that if you allow people to show up as equals for whatever ceremony you have in place, whether it's restorative justice or something more traditional, I think you, I think if you recognize the totality of uh, people's humanity in some of their worst moments, you end up getting the best out of them by giving people the opposite of what they anticipate and what they expect. And so as someone now who can afford it, like I can do things philanthropically that are not the traditional writing a check to a nonprofit, um, that allow me to, again, engage in philanthropy, engage in capitalism in a way that matches my values, because I actually think you can blend the two things. So I appreciate the question. Um, I meandered a bit on the answer, but I hope you get where I'm going with that. No, I think I do. Um, and I think that it's, I mean, I think you've made so many good points. And I, and I was kind of thinking like what you were describing, especially when you're um, kind of like begging the same people and institutions for money is it's like this kind of unhealthy family relationship, like working for like unhealthy dad that's in control of everything. And like, you got to break away from that so you can grow your own. I mean, that's kind of what I'm hearing you say. And then like, then, then we can go back and maybe talk about how to do business together. But like, if you're working under the umbrella of somebody else, there's not like freedom. Like I kept thinking of what you're describing is really just, it's freedom. It's having that ability to do what you want and and give real real opportunities not just you know not a <laughs> not a slogan not a campaign like real opportunities to live right um that charity you know honestly like you know our system of philanthropy and nonprofits is really built around charity and charity is not a charity is not the same as relinquishing power and and uh, allowing others to seize power and own the, own their power. I'll give you two concrete examples. Um, <laughs> um, one is uh, when I was working to close Rikers. Um, it was 2014 when I first said, okay, I am going to see what I can do to raise money to shut down Rikers. I had always thought it needed to be shut down based on my experience there as a 16-year-old and then as a 23-year-old. Um, but I remember going to one of the largest uh, foundations in our space, the Soros Foundation, um, which like, you know, they were sort of the seal of approval. If you didn't have money from Soros for your organization, you almost didn't have any credibility. And yet the thing I wanted to sell to them was the campaign to shut down Rikers. And I remember the off the record message that they gave me one day um, was that George Soros funded the mayor's campaign and there's no way the foundation is gonna do anything to undermine that. And how awful, how awful that we could have a torture island in our backyard of one of the most progressive resource rich cities in the country with a mayor who stood on the steps of city hall with Harry Belafonte and talked about a tale of two cities and have this funder who really does control what work ha uh, uh, happens and what doesn't say to me that, well, you know, because of our political connection to the mayor, we're not going to undermine him by having an advocacy campaign run against him. Although now, years later, I actually think everyone is on the same page as me that this mayor really hasn't shown up uh, based on his rhetoric. So that was one example of like, I was just so disheartened by this foundation that could have gotten me to the finish line, me and the people I was working with a lot sooner. And now you look at the deaths of Rikers this year alone and you say to yourself, you know, that's that was such a missed opportunity to say the least. Um, another example, maybe a little bit funnier, albeit more crass, was uh, we chased the mayor all over the country essentially for a year um, while he called us naive and, 
you know, the advocates don't know what they're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. And he sort of poo-pooed us, if you will. Um, so he couldn't hold a fundraiser without us showing up. Um, and I remember after a year where we sort of uh, brought him to his knees, if you will, um, and he finally said, yeah, we should close Rikers, albeit begrudgingly. Um, the next day, he, as part of his political campaign to run for office again, said, you should give me money to run for office. Guess what? I'm closing Rikers. And I get a call from Political Magazine saying, hey, did you notice that the mayor went from like laughing at you guys to saying, I'm the champion of closing Rikers. You should give me money. What do you feel about that? And of course, I was a bit emotional, but whatever. Um, I'm a human being. I have the right to be emotional. And I said to the reporter, I said, well, I'm not going to let uh, Mayor de Blasio pimp out this campaign the way he pimped out his son Dante to become mayor. Now, Granted, that is like sharp into the act, sort of heavy hitting. And as you can imagine, the reporter hung up the phone and said, thank you very much, because she got what she needed. Um, but I remember getting phone calls from three funders scolding me for using that sort of language. And honestly, the people I engaged, the people who served time on Rikers, they understood. They got that, and they heard me as speaking to them. And it was a campaign all around people who had been most harmed by Rikers. And so, yes, I want to speak the language of the people, the base who I'm trying to motivate because there's been previous efforts to close Rikers. You know, Herb Sturz, the former deputy mayor who just passed away a couple of months ago, mo much of my motivation comes from him and his courage, his courageousness around trying to close Rikers decades ago. In fact, we worked together heavily behind the scene um, to really construct the campaign, but I always knew what was missing from his effort was the voices of people who had been harmed. And, you know, to, uh, to be fair, you know, that wasn't a thing back then, like formerly incarcerated people speaking out 40 years ago, it just wasn't a thing. And then more recently, uh, when Marty Horn, the former commissioner of correction and probation, tried to get Mayor Bloomberg to do it. And again, they tried to do it really insider, behind the scene. They called it decentralization. They never talked about the horrors of Rikers. And that's another reason why it failed. And I knew this time it had to be about people who had actually served time and who had experienced the horrors of Rikers. And, and I, that's, that was my base, that was my audience. And to have these mostly white, liberal, elitist funders pick up the phone and tell me, you can't say that, um, it was terrible. It was a terrible moment for me. It actually made me shameful of uh, having to bend to those voices and, and no longer. Now I don't bend to anyone. Um, part of it is that I'm over 50 and I get to say what I want and do what I want, as long as I'm not anyone. But <laughs> those are the rules. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I I don't want to use the crass terminology to explain it, but uh, I think Will Smith called it the FU fifties. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> so yeah, the combination of uh, where I am now, professionally, chronologically, and financially, really allowed me to have the kind of voice that I wish I had many years ago. But imagine now if I can invest in young and upcoming leaders of color so that they can build wealth at the front of their careers. And so that they can have that cushion to fall back on if a funder says, you know, you can't do that. They can say, not really. I actually can do that because I don't need this salary. Like I have income from other places. So you're hearing a lot more about what motivates me and what motivates me to inspire other leaders, particularly young leaders of color, to really think hard about how to establish themselves before they do good work. Because I have met um, a lot of people in the nonprofit space uh, mostly white, former attorneys, smart people who went to elite institutions, but who really did the sort of making money part of their career first, and then they're doing the good work part of their career. And, you know, I don't judge them for that, but I want that for my people too. Right. Absolutely. And that sounds fair. <laughs> so I definitely, on that note, I would love for you to drop some of that knowledge to all of our viewers. Um, we do have a large base um, of people that want to know more about understanding the leadership IQ. Like how, how can they build their leadership IQ? Like you've talked about these principles that you say are very important to practice. So I'd love to hear about that. And I know our viewers would too. <laughs> Thank you. So I mentioned David Mensah earlier. Um, David Mensah taught me something called Breakthrough Action Leadership. It's also what we used at the time uh, when I was at Just Leadership to engage fellows, uh, over 600 of them. And 
what I'm about to describe is very commonsensical, so it's not going to be earth shattering. But when you put them together and when you live with them and own them and um, practice them, they become really powerful. In fact, I've not come across a challenge in my life where these three principles can't help me uh, find a way through. And I've been in some really dark places. Um, the first thing I would say is it's important for your audience not to listen as if they're listening to the truth, because it's my truth, not the truth. So people can challenge me, um, but this is my truth. And I think if they listen to it as if they're listening to my truth, they'll get the value out of what I'm about to share. Um, the other thing I would say is what I said earlier, which none of us are in jeopardy of mastering anything. So as good as I am at using these principles, there are times where I throw them out the window and forget to use them. And those are usually the moments where I regret things most. Um, but, you know, we all have room to grow and I don't see myself as any sort of guru here. Um, so the three principles are the first one is responsibility. I think it's important for people to take responsibility for the outcome they're producing in situations and relationships, because that is the one and only thing you really have control over. You know, good luck trying to get other people to behave differently. So when you're having a challenge, the ability to stop and say, what responsibility can I take for what's happening here? And then addressing those handful of things that you actually do have control over, even if it means that the person on the other side of the table is not doing their job, is not following through, is being a jerk. All of that may be true. I'm not trying to diminish that. But as a leader, you ask yourself, where do I have power in this situation? Where do I have control? Um, and usually that starts with uh, what can I take responsibility for? So that's number one. Um, number two is being self-reflective and soliciting feedback. So constantly asking yourself, how did I show up in that meeting? How did I show up for that process? How did I show up for that Zoom call? Um, how did I show up uh, uh, for that training? Um, and then recognizing that you can only go so far with that sort of self-analysis and that the next thing you should do is find people around you who you trust, who believe in your leadership, who are gonna hold you in a really compassionate and thoughtful way and recognize your humanity and asking them for feedback about how you show up and take, taking that feedback and not responding to it, but holding it for a while, listening to it, because we tend to respond to feedback to explain away what we did. And the message you end up sending the person you just asked the feedback from is, I don't really want your feedback. So it's important to find a handful of trusted people around you that you can ask for feedback who care about you, um, but are gonna tell you the truth. And again, holding that feedback and processing it before you respond to it. Um, and then the last one is creating collective leadership. Um, often when we're called to leadership, we're trying to figure out what the hell that means. And we end up looking at other leaders and trying to emulate what we think they're doing. And the truth is that it would, leaders um, tend to make it look as though they're going through some exercise of just trying to be as charismatic as possible and trying to be as leadershipy as possible. But the best leaders amongst us actually spend the majority of their time investing in other leaders. And so I always tell people, you know, if you're called to leadership or you're seizing leadership, um, don't worry about how you're going to show up and emulating other leaders. Just spend all your time surrounding yourself with leaders and then investing in them. And those are the three things I try to do no matter what I'm building. And I think it's a huge part of why I've been so successful in building so many things, usually in a very short amount of time, is I surround myself by people who are brilliant, um, who are smarter than me about certain things. Um, and I help them understand the why and they figure out the how, um, because I like to believe they understand that what I'm trying to do is actually make an investment in them, give them a vision to believe in, but spend all the time trying to help them become more and more excellent. And that reminds me of the end of the first cohort of Just Leadership USA, where we had gone through a year of this phenomenal, in-depth, um, really thoughtful, robust training. And I remember we were at graduation and people, we were doing a fireside chat between me and David and a person in the audience said, okay, Glenn, well, we finished this training. It's been amazing. I've never experienced anything like this before. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but what do you want us to do now? Like, you know, give us our marching orders. And I was like, honestly, I just want you to go out there and do something more amazing than what I've done. Like literally, that is the magic here. And people thought like it was just some agenda about like training these soldiers to go out <laughs> and think. And no, it was about it was about really um, seeding the country with leaders who had plans and visions and 
now the self-esteem and the tools and the network and the community to execute those things. And so I've always been a fan of that. Like, I haven't always been a fan of that. I became a fan of that. As soon as I recognized that leading didn't mean always being in front of the room and impressing people, et cetera, et cetera. And I found that humility um, through difficult lessons, through easier lessons. Um, like now I just find so much joy in helping other people to realize their vision. Like I could spend the rest of my life doing that and be okay. I feel like my legacy is behind me, not in front of me. So that's fantastic. And I mean, I definitely, at least all of the people that I've met through Just Leadership um, USA are just phenomenal, phenomenal yeah. people. And I, I want to start naming names. I'm going to leave people off, but, you know, Celia Colon, um, you know, Quentin Williams, and more and more and more. Xavier yeah. went through as well, right? Yeah. Anyone who did, even if they didn't. So the year many people. <laughs> Even if they didn't go through the year-long training, many of them went through the Emerging Leaders training, which is the okay. So uh, there's been a lot of touch points with many, many, many leaders around the country. And more importantly, those leaders now turn around and invest in other people through collective. Exactly. So that's beautiful. Those are, those are great tips. So, I mean, I just, I appreciate your time today and, and talking with us and, you know, just telling us more about your story, how you got to where you are, and then, you know, sharing that knowledge so people can build um, for themselves, their communities, and, yeah, and, you know, help build for others as well. Yeah, well, thanks again for the opportunity and good luck. Keep doing what you're doing. I think it's important and I'm glad to have had the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Take care. You too.